Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Great to have you with us. You have arrived at workshop 2B, the workshop on circular opportunities in buildings and infrastructure, presented by the Assets Leadership Group. And this is one of the most interesting workshops if we do our work right. My name is Freek van Eyck. I'm the, the chair of this leadership group, co-chair of Assets and director of Holland Circular Hotspot. Why this topic? Well, buildings and infrastructure play a crucial role in our life. Just think about the, the basic structures we depend on to enjoy our lives, to the homes we live in, the offices we work at, the roads and railways we travel by. And, uh, however, as speakers after me will testify, the sector has a tremendous impact on our environment. So if we can't make buildings and infrastructure more sustainable, more circular, we can't reach the climate goals, or to put it even more bluntly, we can't save our planet. Now, I think the program we have set up is a nightmare from time management uh, perspective for me as a moderator, but it's absolutely great for you as an audience, because we will have a keynote speech from the Commission by Kiskutis uh, Sedauskas, sharing the EU perspective. We will have an official launch. We will be presenting the first asset branded brochure ever. And we will have three deep dives on key topics, the relevance of deconstruction to enable the renovation wave, uh, we will talk about uh, buildings and infrastructure value chains in markets and circular infrastructure, the road towards a sustainable future. Now, what is probably the most uh, interesting and dynamic part will be the three power pitches from young circular economy entrepreneurs. And they will be followed by a really quality panel with four experts in the sector. And then it's up to you, audience. You have to ask questions and we'll have an interaction. Now, the good news in all this program is that circular European solutions exist in the entire value chain in every part of Europe and they can significantly contribute to climate neutral future. So solutions that can actually inspire the world and create also opportunities uh, for all of us. So um, I would say that's quite interesting. There are some, uh, some house rules. Uh, please uh, put your, all your post your questions uh, for the speakers in the submit a question box, which you can mm -hmm. find uh, uh, on the right. Uh, but please mention to who the, uh, it is addressed to. Note, they will not be visible to the, the rest of the audience, only to the speakers. If you want to interact with the chat, sharing emotions, remarks, appreciations, use the chat function, please. And that will be visible to everybody all the time. Now. Um, for the speakers, uh, please mute your phone uh, all the time, because otherwise the video will shift to you. Don't play around with the slides when somebody else is uh, presenting, because then everybody will see that. Enjoy the session. And now it's with actually with great, great pleasure that I will give the floor to Kistutis Sedauskas, Director for Circular Economy at DG Environment. Uh, and he will share with us a new perspective. Uh, uh, Kistutis, the floor is yours. Hello. I hope we can hear me and see me. Thanks, thanks, Frank, a lot for that introduction and uh, for the initiative to hold the exchange on this topic. Uh, let me say why um, circularity and life cycle thinking are very important aspects for the building and infrastructure sector. Uh, because if we consider the full life cycle of buildings, the sector is responsible for half of all attracted material, half of our total energy consumption, and a third of our total generated waste is construction and demolition waste. Up to now, the focus uh, of Europe, um, as well as national building policies, have been mainly on energy performance during the use phase of buildings. This covers the energy for heating and cooling and so on. But in order to really decarbonize the building stock, we must look at the full life cycle. This means that we should also consider what happens before and after the use of the buildings. There are lots of carbon emissions, for example, from the extraction of materials and manufacturing of construction products. This is where the circularity and life cycle thinking come in. What if we, in order to make our buildings more efficient, use a lot of material in an inefficient way, which comes with their own carbon costs? What if um, the so-called embodied carbon is of such a quantity that you will have to use the building in very energy efficient way for 20, 30, 
40, 50 years before that initial carbon cost is paid off? What if we are renovating our existing buildings to become more energy efficient in such a way that at the end of life, the insulation cannot be separated from the concrete so that all this material ends up on the landfill as opposed to being recycled. This is to a large extent the current situation. We therefore need modern policies for buildings which acknowledge and make use of circularity and life cycle thinking to reach our climate target and carbon neutrality. This will help us reach our targets in a much more cost efficient way. Several EU member states are moving ahead in this area. They understand that this is the most cost efficient way to reduce carbon emissions. The European Commission is doing its homework and we are in good position. For the last couple of years, we have in great collaboration with the sector developed a common language to assess and report the sustainability uh, performance of buildings. It covers a range of aspects from resource use to health and comfort to life cycle cost and value. We call this framework levels. The name is levels. It is, um, it of course includes the whole life carbon and most importantly uses indicators which help a beginner to get on track to assess these carbon emissions. During 2021, we have started to use levels as a basis for circularity and life cycle thinking in a range of policy initiatives and legislative proposals. Uh, three key ones are energy performance of buildings directive. This is the key building performance legislation in European Union. The proposal for its revision includes the requirement to assess and report on whole life carbon for new buildings. It thus takes life cycle thinking and circularity into account when setting out legislation to decarbonize the building stock. Then we have sustainable finance, an initiative targeting private investment, the famous taxonomy. Uh, it sets out criteria that needs uh, to be fulfilled uh, to define uh, the investments as sustainable. Again, the requirement is there to assess and report on whole life carbon for new buildings. And then we have beautiful idea of new European Bauhaus. This is a new kind of policy initiative. It is broad and linked sustainability, aesthetics, social inclusion, and circularity here plays a key role. The new European Bauhaus aims at creating a new life cycle that matches sustainability with good design that needs less carbon, and that is inclusive and affordable to all. Now, circularity and life cycle thinking is not only important for the sake of carbon emissions. If we use our material, but also buildings in an efficient way, we will see many other benefits. We will hear today from different speakers about how they're working with circularity, what solutions they have, how they consider and assess benefits. So with this, really back to you and uh, being very curious to hear your experiences, your ideas. Thank you. So much, uh, Director Sadauskas. Thank you, Kestutis. Uh, you spoke about the full life cycle approach, the common language, uh, indicators, uh, sustainable finance, and the non-EU Bauhaus. Thank you so much for all these insights. Uh, um, well, all these things that you mentioned, they, they actually ask for an intense collaboration between stakeholders. And this leadership group has brought together more than 20 different stakeholders from all over Europe, experts from the sector, and as you have presented us with the work of the Commission, we gladly share ourselves, our work and our findings with you, because we have bundled all our intelligence in a new brochure, an asset branded brochure. And basically it's full, it's a source of facts and figures. It has more than 30 best practices from all over Europe in it, and has a set of reflections on, on policies. It's the state of play, if you want. Uh, now, we in Europe, we are blessed, I think, with a forward-looking commission, yet together we have to step up our game. And we hope that this brochure will help to inspire you and the commission to set the ambition and to set the boundary conditions uh, for our work. So I will gladly virtually hand over this, uh, this brochure to you. It's a collector's item. There's only one of two in the world, which is the physical copy. And the rest is for everybody free to download from the asset site uh, 
as of today. Mr. Sedaskas, here you go. I'm back to you for a short reaction. Thank you very much. I've got it. <laughs> here it is. And thanks a lot, really, for uh, for uh, sharing it uh, with us as well as with uh, uh, with everybody else. Um, I, <clears throat> I was very happy to see how information from our work on levels here is directly included to underpin your arguments. The link between the circularity and carbon emissions is fundamental, and your work really lays out very clearly. It is a work that the Commission is pursuing as well. Um, again, in renovation wave on developing a roadmap for the reduction of whole life carbon, um, uh, which is investigated to all across the UN. Of course, the different policy initiatives I just mentioned go really hand in hand with this thinking. So this is really something that we'll have to work together on. And the case studies uh, or examples, what we should call them, that you present can serve as a great inspiration. So please share your experience across the EU. We'll, we'll be with you on that across the sectors including the real estate businesses, architects, developers, investors, buyers, everybody who may have anything to do with it. So thank you very much for that. Great piece. Great piece. Thank you for your remarks and wise words, Kestutis. We look very much forward to collaborating with the Commission on this topic. Uh, you will have to leave us right now, but thank you so much for having had time for us to be with us. Um, and we continue with our program. And our leadership group uh, did three deep dives this year. The relevance of deconstruction design to enable the renovation wave by DGNB, built in infrastructure value chains and markets led by Enea, and circular infrastructure, the road towards a sustainable future, led by Rijkswaterstaat, RWS. Well, we'd gladly share, of course, their findings. Um, and how does it work? Well, the leading partners of these three topics, DGNB, Enea, and Rijkswaterstaat, they will actually present the topic. But as we want to give the floor to all the stakeholders in our leadership group, there will be other uh, uh, renowned team members from the groups who will represent this topic in the panel later on. And the, the first one to take the floor is Anna Brown, Head of Research and Development at DGNB, or the German Sustainable uh, Building Council, if you want. Uh, for the audience, please remember to ask questions. Post all your questions in the, in the, for the speakers in the submit a question box. Mention for who it is. And remember, it will only be visible to the speakers, not to the rest. Anna, the next seven minutes are yours. Please inspire us. Thank you. Um, so welcome from my side as well. Um, I have seven minutes, uh, very exciting. Um, so uh, one thing um, that I don't want to repeat, but maybe uh, a little bit visual. Mention for who it is. And remember, it will only be visible to the speakers, not to the rest. Anna, the next seven minutes are yours. Please. Um, there was an echo, so sorry. I was just interrupted. Um, so. Um, but to be very brief, um, we do have a problem um, uh, from the built environment. We know that we have large uh, resource consumptions. Now we know what it means uh, um, to be dependent uh, uh, from a resource perspective. Uh, we cause emissions and we cause a lot of waste. Um, I don't want to repeat this, but um, it is really crucial that we understand the urgency of um, that we have to change um, building and especially deconstruction practices today. Um, what how could uh, tomorrow look, look like um, in future we think that uh, buildings can uh, be seen different than a producer of waste a producer of emissions uh, a consuming monster so to say but um, buildings or the built environment can be seen as an urban mine if you, we change this narrative and really say um, the built environment as it is is our um, sort of uh, warehouse of uh, building products of materials of resources um, then it's uh, it changes a lot um, um, also in the way we're designing it um, if we understand that closing the loops um, so the building practices can help and drive markets to circular products for example um, then uh, it, it will change a lot and if uh, but of course if we um, understand buildings as a very high value the things that are built once that we need to preserve them that we need to protect them that we need to make sure that um, all the resources all the emissions all the money that uh, went 
into the building once um, is worth keeping it. Um, um, that's also a different narrative. Um, so what does it mean, closing loops? Closing loop means um, if we look at um, sort of the life cycle thinking today, starting usually with the planning of, uh, you know, an empty space that somebody where somebody can build something new on it. Then we have the construction and the operational phase and um, uh, maybe someone thinks of renovating or refurbishing. Then there's a new operational phase and then one day comes the end of life, um, we need to change the attitude in, by saying, for example, the things that we have today is sort of the start of life. Um, how can, uh, you know, the, the, the um, values that we have is uh, sort of the starting point and not an end point. Um, that's the narrative, I think, that is very important. And if you think that through, um, you understand why it is so, so important to um, change the way we deconstruct today. So if we understand that the building stock is um, very um, uh, uh, is, is crucial to be kept as it uh, and change it and adapt it, but keep the materials, keep the resources, um, then it's uh, sort of step number one that you should take. And uh, secondly, if you understand then that the building stock is a source of raw materials for a later stage of point, uh, point of time or um, for somebody else, then it's also uh, sort of the second step that you should take, um, that the values are well known. Then third, if something has to be deconstructed or partly deconstructed, of course, it is so crucial to close the loops. Um, and that deconstruction is understand as the starting point. Um, and if you renovate or if a new building is built, um, then to close the loops already today means, of course, to use and reuse recycled materials. That's a no-brainer, but also de to design for longevity and for deconstruction. But that's just a promise, I would say. Um, and we need to make sure that today's loops are closed already. So last slide, um, DGNB has worked on uh, this field um, very intensively um, over the last years. Uh, we uh, provided a circular economy in building and construction guideline um, a few years ago already. And out of this, we also um, uh, developed a certificate for sustainable deconstruction. And this certificate is very important for us where we say if a partly deconstruction or deconstruction takes place, how can you make it? How can you get the most out of it? Uh, keep the resources, um, understand the value and um, deconstruct in a way that um, uh, yeah, sort of uh, loops are closed and people uh, get jobs um, in uh, nearby in the region and not uh, somewhere else. And then secondly, we do have um, DGNB as a as a council that um, is uh, I think it's we are uh, Europe's largest network with um, more than 1,500 member organizations and people use our standard and we have our uh, renovation standards, sustainable renovation standards, sustainable new construction, sustainable use of buildings. And in all our um, sort of certificates, we have introduced um, uh, uh, many incentives to, um, to more circularity. Um, and um, that's very important for changing the things today. And with this, I hand over and head back um, to uh, the moderator. Thank you so much, Anna. You are a great ambassador for the DGMB, and I think that your topic should be a cornerstone of the of the renovation wave. Uh, um, we continue our program to allow for uh, the maximum uh, time for questions and interaction, um, and we move to another very active member in the last two years. That's Inea. So we are very pleased to have the immensely knowledgeable Laura Kutaya with us. She will guide us through the topic of buildings and infrastructure value chains and markets. Uh, and your job as an audience is to ask questions, of course, in the in the right box. Uh, uh, so, Laura, please enlighten us. Thank you, Frick, for uh, the presentation, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I am uh, I'm working in an area, and is a research center in Italy. So let's, let's, next slide, please. 
okay? And uh, we had uh, quite long uh, experience in, uh, in this topic. Um, I was a member of the previous uh, coordination group of HSP, and uh, within this framework, we founded the Italian Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, which is uh, the sort of hub, Italian hub for the circular economy. And within this uh, activity, in last year, 2020, we had the first uh, workshop on this topic, on constructive infrastructure and circular economy. Um, going to the slide the next, please. Uh, the point now we 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 worked on the um, the connection between the um, the potential of the circular economy along the value chain of structural infrastructure, but also the uh, potential connection between this value chain and other value chains. Um, the topic of the uh, the two twin uh, workshop we promoted with other uh, partners. Uh, in 2021 was exactly on this point on the collaboration along the value chain and also the potential collaboration with other value chains in order to enhance the circular economy in the construction infrastructure sector but also on the connection with the market of uh, uh, secondary materials and uh, uh, the mm, relation between the market and the uh, production of secondary materials coming from the this value chain and other value chains. Next, please. Next, please. Okay. Um, we had we had some uh, reflections, some points coming from the um, confront with the stakeholders, and uh, first uh, first point is the need uh, of better integration between policies. Uh, connected to the building infrastructure se sectors. The second point is the imagine a very big market gap uh, compared to the potential coming from this sector. Uh, so this market could be should be uh, um, should be expressed should be um, uh, resolved. Uh, there is a need of uh, um, traceability of waste streams uh, and byproducts. Uh, so we should know in order to understand how to uh, um, reuse and recover these materials to uh, boost the potential of these materials. And the uh, uh, last one uh, should be uh, boosted the awareness of clients, potential consumer of uh, these materials, uh, secondary materials, uh, for designing, implementing, and operating issues uh, uh, related to the building infrastructure value chain. The next, please. Um, there are some drivers uh, in these regards. Uh, what emerged from the uh, circular talks was that uh, Companies, very big one, that uh, take part to this uh, to our uh, circular talk, are, are have the technologies and also have the willingness to move towards the circular economy. There are some gaps. So, as a sample, the gap, the market gap already mentioned, that should be uh, solved in order to um, allow these uh, um, stakeholders to move uh, freely towards the circular economy to have a role. Levels already mentioned is uh, could be could play a, a important role in the for the common framework for moving in the common framework in this regard. Also, the uh, green procurement and the circular procurement could be, could play an important role in this regard, and in particular, green public procurement, which is in Italy mandatory, could play an important role to. Uh, boost the use of secondary materials in this uh, value chain. And uh, uh, another point is the potential coming from the dig digitalization of process and information data sets uh, in order to, 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 to track, to, to have uh, information about the value chain uh, from a point of view of life cycle thinking from the beginning to the end of uh, uh, the life of materials and uh, buildings. Uh, in this figure, we have a 
an image, an image of uh, um, a building in Italy made with 98% of recycled materials. This building is uh, lead platinum and is green public procurement compliant. So it can be done, uh, but we can, uh, it's important to move in a very large perspective uh, in this, uh, uh, towards the circular economy from, for the building uh, value chain. The next, please. Uh, so summarizing, we need to promote a holistic life cycle thinking approach. We should take into consideration demand and supply of materials in building infrastructure from building infrastructure. And then we had, we need the system for monitoring uh, data collection and assessment for monitoring this circular, the circularity of the uh, value chains and among value chains. Uh, yeah, we have an example of uh, uh, digital platform for uh, sharing uh, materials and resources. And that's all. Thank you again for, for, for this, for, for this event. And uh, I leave the floor again to the, moder to the moderator. Thank you. Grazie Laura. Seven minutes to tackle such a vast topic is not a minor challenge. Uh, and I think what you have shown that I, the building and infrastructure sector has a huge potential uh, in the recovery and reuse of secondary materials, but it's an, uh, actually a potential that needs to be unlocked. Uh, so I'm really curious to, to find the questions to where can we find the answers? What should be our priorities here? Um, we move on to the next speaker. And last but not least is uh, the topic of circular infrastructure. And if there's one institute in the Netherlands uh, that knows a lot about this topic, it's Rijkswaterstaat, RWS. So we're very pleased to have uh, Jessica uh, Reis Leffers with us. She's advisor at Rijkswaterstaat. And also for you, Jessica, you have seven minutes to, uh, to enlighten us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Freik, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today uh, with you to talk about the special publication on circular infrastructure, which was a collaboration between Holland Circular Hotspots, TNO, uh, the Dutch Circular Construction Transition Team, and of course, Exatestad. And um, to start with, the reason why we developed this dedication publication on infrastructure is that often when talking about the construction sector, the focus is solely on buildings. But just like buildings, infrastructure such as roads, bridges and tunnels is a very important part of the built environment. In fact, infrastructure is one of the cornerstones of our global economies. It enables trade, connects supply chains, facilitates the movement of billions of people every day, creates opportunities in struggling communities and protects nations from unpredictable natural disasters. So the value of uh, infrastructure in our lives is very evident but so is its environmental impact. And to give you an impression, it has been already said, but I will stress again, in Europe, the construction sector is responsible for half of all extracted materials and energy consumption, as well as for one third of the water consumption and waste generation. Half of these numbers is attributed to the infrastructure sector. Infrastructure works are very, very large projects and require huge amounts of groundwork and materials such as asphalt, concrete and steel, which are very carbon intensive to manufacture and to transport. So the sector has a tremendous role to take on in the fight against, against global warming and resource scarcity. And this role is only expected to grow with the rising population with climate change, the need for more infrastructure and the need to replace existing infrastructure, especially in Europe, where infrastructure is becoming obsolete. And while there is a growing demand for infrastructure, projects have been suffering from shortages and unavailability of materials due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this 
are only a few examples of the challenges infrastructure faces. And this means that we have a huge struggle to deliver this infrastructure, to deliver on the Paris Climate Agreement and to protect our planetary boundaries. But we are convinced that the sector can make a major contribution to achieving circular and net zero economies and deserves more attention in the sustainable development agendas. In the Netherlands, it is an integral part of the circular and climate policy frameworks. So our government launched in 2016 the national program uh, on circular infrastructure, sorry, on circular economy, uh, with the aim of being fully circular by 2050 and reducing 50% of the use of raw materials by 2030. And the program defines five transition agendas for the five value chains with the most impact. The construction sector obviously is one of them and focuses explicitly on both buildings and infrastructure. Because these sectors share so many similarities and challenges, we are convinced that an integrated approach is of great added value and necessary to maximize the benefits. We have been experimenting with circular uh, infrastructure for some time, and we have a number of practical examples to share with you. To name a few, the first circular viaduct, which is a result of a partnership and has been built to last for more than 200 years with many detachable elements that can be remounted and demounted, road furniture based on circular design principles, and on existing or renewable uh, materials. As for innovations, we have the smart crusher that allows high grade reuse of concrete. Several best practices as well in the area of circular procurement, such as the double coke and a number of sharing knowledge, uh, knowledge sharing platforms, such as the platform circular construction in 2023 where guidelines are being developed for the entire sector for measuring circularity, developing materials passports, circular design, and so on. And finally, we have a number of value chain collaborations in which stakeholders in the supply chain work together to make the sector more sustainable. All of these best practices and more can be found in the publication. And um, these examples show you how much uh, is possible and could be implemented. But for a circular infrastructure to reach its full potential and scale necessary for a sustainable future, we need the right ambitions, we need the right policies and actions. And fortunately, many ambitious infrastructure plans are being worked out all around the world. In the US, for example, Biden struck a mega deal for infrastructure investments and the G7 launched the Build Back Better World Initiative. And on the policy front, um, with the European Green Deal, the New Circular Economy Action Plan, the famous taxonomy, as well as the Green Recovery Fund, can be very important drivers for circular change in circular uh, in infrastructure in Europe. So clearly, the moment is the moment is now to act, and for this, we need to work together. And as Timmermans stressed yesterday in his opening speech, we need that more than ever before. After all, supply chains are spread over several countries and many economies are highly dependent on international raw material flows. Cooperation through supply chains across Europe and across the globe is paramount and needed for so many reasons, to name a few, to boost co-creation and knowledge development, ensure alignment and harmonization of protocols, norms and standards, to create a well-functioning market for renewable and secondary raw materials, and finally, to change the way green infrastructure projects are being financed. This is why we propose a multi-stakeholder action plan in this publication, and um, which calls for international cooperation and outlines a roadmap of the necessary steps we believe need to be taken to help unlock the circular 
uh, infrastructure potential. And luckily, we can start from a lot of existing knowledge and many lessons learned. Um, I think that for you, uh, it's clear that for us, circular infrastructure is the road towards a sustainable future. I hope this presentation has inspired you and that you will join us on this road as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jessica. Well, uh, well done. Uh, uh, you made ample, let's say, uh, publicity for the infrastructure brochure, which can be downloaded on the ESSIP site, but also on the Holland Circular Hotspot site. But as you said, there is added value in an integrated approach. And that's why we, as ESSIP, have made an integrated report, which can be found also on the assets uh, side. Uh, um, so thanks, thanks again. And uh, we are looking at the audience to send in lots of questions uh, for you on this topics and for the panel, of course. Uh, uh, now, while we do a lot of talking in our leadership group, we should never forget that there are in the meantime, actually lots of companies that are walking the talk and their stories, uh, the persistence and the passion of the entrepreneurs are typically what stays in our mind most. So. In this session, in the next session, we want to give the stage to three young entrepreneurs and, well, we put them to the test. They will have to present uh, themselves and their innovation in one minute power pitch. And you as an audience uh, have one minute to come up with a question for each of them. So please make use of that. You can see all the names uh, on the, and the order in the screen. They will present one after the other. So a warm welcome to our three pitches. We can't have, a, a, let's say, a loud applause here, but show your enthusiasm in the chat and send your questions to the question box. Um, so first I will mention the names. We have Dominique Campanella from Concular, Emmanuel Falapa from Rijshaus, and Wies van Lieshout from Waterweg. Uh, Dominique, are you ready for the first power pitch of one minute? Dominique Campanella, are you with us? Okay, we are looking for Dominique, so we changed the order again. So this puts some pressure on Emmanuel Falapa from Rice House to start with a one minute power pitch. Uh, Emmanuel. Can we have uh, Emmanuel with us? We are struggling a little bit to get uh, the, the, the connection to the power pitchers. Um, Wies van Lieshout, who for sure I know that is there. So Wies van Lieshout, one minute power pitch for you. And in the meantime, we're trying to chase the other uh, young entrepreneurs. Uh, Wies, please take the floor and mute your mic. Thank you. I hope you can hear me well. I'm Wies van Lieshout and together with Eva Aerts, I founded Waterweg. With Waterweg, we work with dredged sediments and dredged sediments is a huge waste stream. In the Netherlands only, we have 400 million cubic meters every year. And now it's only applicated for low value applications or it's going to landfills that are going fuller and fuller. On the other hand, we also see that our cities are dealing with climate change. When there's a lot of rain, we see our cities overflowing. Uh, and next to that, we are in a great need of sustainable building materials, while there is not a lot yet that is offered on a big scale. Therefore, we decided to use dress sediments in a water passing pavement in order to offer a circular and a climate adaptive solution for our future cities. Thank you very much. So much, uh, Wies van Lieshout from Waterweg. Uh, um, so make your points, make your remarks. We go back to Dominique. We have seen that he's around. Dominique, the floor is yours for one minute. Okay. Oh, 
Perfect. Now it's working. Um, yeah, so my name is Omni Campanella and I'm one of the co-founders of Concula and uh, we are the leading ecosystem for circular construction. So what we are doing is that we help to digitize the materials in buildings using so-called material passports in new and also existing buildings. And when you have this digital inventory, you're able to do a lot of things with that. For example, you can calculate how much embodied carbon is in your building, but you can also calculate the so-called residual value on how much your material is worth if you're not landfilling it, but instead recirculating it. And you can also do this recirculation with Concula. So if a deconstruction or refurbishment of the building is happening, we take care about these materials that they are getting recirculated to the manufacturers, recycling companies, and so on, so that they're not in the end in the landfill. And with that, we hope that we can give you an input and I'm happy to, um, if you can reach out to me for any further information. Thank you. Exactly in one minute, well done. Over to you, Emmanuel Falapa from Rice House. And can you hear me right now? We can. Okay, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm an, uh, Emmanuel, I'm an architect and I collaborate with uh, the Rice House team. Rice House is a benefit corporation and also a startup. It born from the experience of Tiziana Monterisi. Uh, she's an architect and the, key, the CEO of the company, together with Alessio Colombo, a geologist and uh, a CEO. The startup is focused on the valorization of natural architecture by enhancing the byproduct of rice processing. So that means a concrete business model based on the circular economy of the one of the most common cereal production chain, that is rice. So we have analyzed all the byproducts from rice, from the rice chain, and we saw the real opportunity of using the raw materials in architecture. So right now we are commercializing uh, new building materials such as straw, ask, thermoplaster, lightweight screed, finishes in ask lime, and insulation panel. Um, I think that so we, we are trying to pursuing all the goals uh, from uh, defined by the United Station, uh, this United uh, Organization, and we are pers uh, pursuing eight of 17 goals defined by them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to see the Rice House on the picture. I would love to visit it actually. So that was it. Uh, great passion, great innovations. I, I wish we had a live audience that we could give them a, a deafening applause uh, uh, because they deserve it. Um, then what's next in the program? I will present to you our expert panel. And uh, we have with us uh, Gonzalo Sanchez uh, from the European Environmental Bureau. We have Johannes Kisser from Alchemia Nova. Uh, we have Sabine Oberhuber from Turn2 and from Madaster. And we have Fernando Sichos Jimenez from the European Builders Confederation. Uh, lots of talents, lots of insight. And I want to ask them to react on the innovations, uh, actually. And the first one to reflect, and they get the same challenge as the, the, the pictures. They have a time for a one minute reactions. The first to react will be Johannes Kisser. And please reflect on Waterweg. Oh, hi. I, I, I love the, this concept of, of using old sediments, sludge of all sorts to compress it into bricks and then again we use them for construction. If we then combine these with uh, secondary by or byproducts from, from other processes like fibers or, or any other compound compoundable materials, this is a great innovation and can really store carbon for a long time and use residual materials all along the way. If you don't even combine it with a, a click brick, like kind of deconstructable system, that's a very nice solution. I can imagine uh, different versions uh, with, with air bubbles and, and the like to increase also insulation properties. Uh, and uh, the, the, in general, I think it's a, it's a great potential and I would love to work uh, more with this material. Thank you so much for being there. Johannes, over to Fernando. Fernando, what has been your favorite? Can we have a reaction from you on the pictures as well? Everyone, um, EBC represents construction SMEs and crafts. And for us, um, 
I think that Concolor um, sounds familiar because indeed the lack of data uh, is a key uh, is a key obstacle to our activity in the renovation market. Um, most of the most of the work we consider um, that has to be done is with uh, the existing building start, and we notice that indeed when when we have data we are lucky but most of time when we have data it's not of good quality so it's very hard for us to to have let's say a baseline to to start developing a project of renovation for a for for a building so in that case the, the activity by uh, concular makes sense and brings about so much uh, gonzalo over to you for another uh, reflection yeah can you hear me yeah yes well, uh, thank you everyone and thanks for having me today. Well, uh, as mentioned, my name is Gonzalo. I'm the policy officer on circular economy in the environmental European Bugo, which is the largest network organization of environmental citizens in Europe. And well, regarding the rice host representation, first of all, I would like to highlight that the 100% natural products are crucial to the carbonize of the built environment. And it is even better if they are obtained as byproducts of industrial processes. And it's crucial to support low carbon material based on waste. And this business model should be the norm for manufacturers in the construction sector. However, uh, we have to be conscious uh, that uh, there are some barriers of these products have to, to deal with to be placed on the market. And they, these barriers should be removed. For instance, if the construction plan regulation includes minimal environmental performance requirements, these circular materials will be much more appreciated in the market and will be more interesting for investors. And the lower body emissions these materials have, the more appealing they should be for the market. And these efforts that these companies made to promote this circular, low carbon and natural materials should be rewarded with a framework to make this market interested in them. So well, I will leave the floor here and looking forward for the next discussion. So much as we have time, Sabine, can you react on one of your on, on of one of the pictures as well? We have three pictures and four panelists, but I wanted to give you the floor as well, the opportunity to react. I wanted to react on uh, what uh, Jessica has been saying, and I think it also touches upon um, what Lara has been saying. I think the uh, collaboration across value chains is incredibly important. Uh, we see that uh, um, you have uh, um, the um, expertise and also the um, the um, commitment of all parties involved if you really want to realize a circular project and uh, um, so working closely with uh, suppliers and with uh, the builders and with uh, infrastructure companies like Rijkswaterstaat or uh, for example we've been working for the Dutch railway um, um, infrastructure um, ProRail, you see um, that really high quality circular project projects can only be uh, realized if they all those uh, work closely together and um, having this idea of a, a broad um, roadmap international roadmap for um, infrastructure and collaboration would bring scale to this uh, to um, uh, circular solution because that is also something which we see is a real bottleneck if you uh, cannot scale um, a certain solution then you will never make it to the market and last but not least also um, really um, uh, documenting every everything in a digital way and knowing what you can reuse and how it has been used um, in, 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 a, in a certain life phase is, is an, another prerogative um, for a certain um, circular uh, construction in infrastructure uh, project. I think uh, that's where uh, the material passports uh, come in, uh, which can work both at building level and infrastructure level. Uh, we're likely to hear more about it later. Let's move for a reaction also on the, the, the deep dives, the power pitches. Uh, uh, Fernando, uh, you heard to, to the three deep dives. What, uh, what's your remark? What are your observations? What do you want to strengthen? Uh, which, in which context you want to place it? I think I will focus on the presentation made by Enea and Laura, uh, because indeed we do agree that um, circular construction uh, will start with a real collaboration uh, across the whole construction value chain. Um, we consider ourselves, construction SMEs and for us, to be the ones that are going to implement circular economy, 
but um, implement means installing uh, re renewable systems, means reducing um, the energy demand of, of the buildings. But uh, we, we are not, um, I mean, we are not covering the whole spectrum there. Um, we indeed need um, to be, um, let's say, uh, in collaboration with the product, uh, producers of materials, and we have good relationships um, today with them uh, in, the, in the sense that we are aware that one of the main ways to, to link the work of producers and um, contractors is that we collaborate on how the products are developed, um, integrating, um, let's say, secondary raw materials, integrating um, waste, uh, what we call waste actually, um, in, in new, um, more sustainable products. Um, and so I, I think that's that's a, 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 a truth. There, there won't be a, any circular construction without any a, a true and deep collaboration among the construction value chain. But then we are all faced with um, some issues um, and which are, to me, horizontal issues. Um, Concular made a presentation about how digitalization is improving um, and is applied in the work. And indeed, digitalization is an enabler. Uh, we consider it as a as a great tool to um, better the communication between the, the among the, the construction value chain to also provide a few tools that are uh, of added value of real added value on, on site. But we are still facing a digital literacy issue. Um, we are we have an horizontal problem in the construction industry is that people are not appealed by the career that we offer and we do consider that circular economy could be um one of the let's say part of the new way of presenting the construction sector because careers are changing perspectives are changing and we do need uh, new talents to integrate in new talents but also um we need to offer them something new that's far from the stereotypes that have been uh, shared about the construction industry and i think that this willingness to get into a circularity in a circular model business a business model um will be more appealing um that's one and that's also part of the collaborative effort that we need to make as, as the as the whole construction value chain um but yeah i i, I mean we are also um dealing with uh, several other factors and um and i think in addition to digital lit uh, literacy we also need to collaborate um in order to convince clients about the added value and i think that we are uh, on a, on the right way uh, on the right direction there because everything starts with the client request uh, if clients are not aware of the added value bring brought by a circular economy to um, or a civil society uh, we are not going to be incentivized to to, to develop further or offer um, with, um, let's say, more sustainable products. So we also need collaboratively to, to convince the clients and civil society about the need and the possibilities. And that's great uh, that the brochure is going in, into that direction as well to share real best practices of things that are functioning, uh, that things that are real a reality already uh, and not I know everyone is, is aware of. Um, well, thank you, Fernando. I think we we have to leave some some space for the others as well, because you, of course, you represent the federation, and this tackles your whole uh, your whole area of expertise. So you could probably talk for one and a half hour. So thanks for the the valuable thing and stressing the demand side in the market. Uh, that's an important one as well. I want to give the floor to Gonzalo because uh, that's uh, the European Environmental Bureau, of course, is also an organization that tackles the whole span and knows about all the, the, the aspects in the in the field. So, Gonzalo, I was very curious to hear your expertise based on all the deep dives. Uh, over to you. Thanks. Uh, well, I would like to react to Anna's presentation from the DGMB on the construction design and the renovation web. And well, first of all, I would like to remind you that the aim is to expand the life, lifespan of buildings. Uh, however, if a building has to be dismantled, an holistic European legislation review is needed to ensure the correct recovery of materials. And the, policy, the European policy framework should be revised in a coordinated way to promote secret construction processes in the life cycle of buildings. The three main policies that we have an impact on buildings should be revised under this approach, uh, which are, you already know, the construction broad regulation, the waste framework directive and the energy performance Buildings directive. 
some specific measures should be integrated in this directive. And maybe we have the opportunity to discuss them after. Uh, however, it's important to have in mind the calendar for it. The EPBD and the CPR are currently under revision and the renovation wave will be implemented in the coming years. Therefore, we are in a pivotal moment to achieve it and failure to do so will mean missing an historic opportunity and postponing a similar approach to construction by a decade. So the let's take this point. What do we need from uh, from? We have almost a hundred participants here. What do we need to to speed up these topics or to put them sharper? What's your appeal to the the audience here? In terms of the policy approach, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, in in that sense, uh, we would like to to call for some specific measures at the policy level. For instance, uh, with the frame with the wage framework directive. Uh, we want to increase and a minimum of 19% body weight in preparation for reuse it, recycling and another material recovery of non hazardous construction and demolition materials. La uh, landfilling and non of non hazardous weights should be avoided and the demolition audits should be mandatory. Uh, when it comes to the construction plan of regulations, we can support the circular use of products by establishing minimum circular requirements to promote their reliability the reparability, the reusability and recyclability for new products and the information and instructions for disassembling them. And uh, well, of course, with the energy performance on building directive, uh, both promoting the use of secondary materials in new buildings and renovations and ensuring that recovery of materials salvage from renovations processes through the pre-demolition pre audit are crucial for creating a circular market with a not supply and could respond to the demand. And this kind of measures could be implemented now in the current legislation and support the innovation wave, like uh, the first big uh, pivotal and yeah, uh, action or, or, or European movement to achieve it. Thank you so much, uh, Gonzalez. Uh, over to Johannes. And Johannes doesn't only know a lot about uh, about building and infrastructure, he's also very much involved in projects. So I'm curious to know your reflections, uh, Johannes. And after your contribution, we'll go to the Q&A with the audience. So this is an appeal for the audience, presenting your question, especially for the young people, but also for the experts. Over to you, Johannes. Thank you, Frick. The I have, um, I mean, many things have been said, but the I, I would call for two main points. One is that uh, in these days we can now even con convince asset managers to to take over circularity innovations in their buildings, especially if they if they, if they uh, are owners of the buildings afterwards, they can retrieve value, recover the value at the end of the life cycle of the building, which is a very good additional bonus if you want so. And this can even be reflected in the books. So you, you will have a, a higher value over the lifetime and at the end of the building you will have a, a, a still value. So uh, not a minus value as is the usual case. So that's uh, something we have just convinced, I think, uh, a very big asset managers yesterday uh, um, that, that plan to do something in that direction. Um, that's the one point. And the other point is that I think we need uh, many pilots and demonstration cases to gain more trust in the solutions. It is a long way until, you know, buildings will be sold as services, but we need the front runners there and we need the financing for this front runners there. And, uh, and we need the buildings that, that really want to include these and especially buildings that have a very good replicator effect. So uh, I call on to the community to uh, think about it and try to, to I uh, think about possible buildings in their uh, neighborhood. They, of course, they, they should have like, a good connection to the ownership and then either in, get invited in, uh, in new projects for that or in uh, national projects. But um, to gain trust, demonstrations is, is key. Very much, Johannes. Uh, we'll now ask the, the three uh, young entrepreneurs to join us in the Q&A with the audience. And I see that we have a first question for Dominique from Concular. And 
Dominique, can I uh, give you the floor to answer the question? And the question is, uh, since Europe is one market, are the material passports that you use open source and are free to use by all architects? Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Um, so right now, Konkla is operating in a German speaking area. So Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Um, you can, of course, use our product also for other markets, but we're not actively um, going uh, or we're not actively like involved in that. Um, the question regarding open source and free is, uh, yeah, it's quite particular one. So, I mean, uh, there's also other providers uh, for material passports such as Madaster. Um, and uh, so far as I know, like there is, of course, because I mean, we are a startup, we have to develop this product. Um, there is, um, is a fee behind that. Uh, but basically it can be used by all architects or all stakeholders in the uh, in in, uh, in in the construction sector thank you so much uh, dominic uh, there is a question from anna for dgnb and i'm going to rephrase the question a little bit because anna is not with us in the chat but i'm going to ask the question to uh, the architect in our midst to sabine um, uh, the question was, is your guide for building, uh, for deconstruction mean that you only completely de do a deconstruction of a whole building or does it assess also small refurbishment deconstruction works? Uh, Sabine, uh, you are an architect, you design for deconstruction. Do you that for the building as a whole or can you do it small scale for small refurbishment? How does it work? Uh, just to, to clarify, I'm not an architect. I work very closely with an architect, uh, my husband, but um, I'm not an architect myself. Um, but I think um, it is, you, you should, in every case, when you're renewing something, uh, think about the next step and the next step meaning the next uh, life cycle so um if you are renovating a building it does not uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, about looking what is already th there what can you um how can you maximize reuse but everything which you bring in as new how can you make sure that these can be um features can be reused in the future so just to give you an example we recently um uh, finished a building a couple of years ago um, which was a um, renovation of a really large office building. We kept as much as we could and we covered the whole construction uh, with a big, big um, steel roof construction, which we uh, constructed together with a roller coaster company because they are um, uh, used to think in steel structures, which you can reconfigure, which you can uh, uh, assemble, disassemble, transport and reassemble. So I think uh, um, in any case, you have to consider as many of the cycles as possible in anything you do. I hope that gives you an answer. Yes, I much appreciated. We have another question, uh, which was again for Anna, which we, I will want to ask uh, in the first place to, uh, to uh, Fernando, and which has to do, there's not only in building, but there are also installations and there are also heavy machinery installations i think of cooling or heating for instance how do they fit into equation uh, do you work along uh, take them along if you're talking about uh, circular manufacturing and circular buildings together can you give a reaction on that mm, on the installers right um yeah i mean part of our membership are indeed installers uh, i won't be talking about ev machinery uh, but more about installer of renewal systems um and I, again, uh, I mean, for for us, the role is key uh, because yeah, I was saying that construction SMEs are the ones that are going to implement circular construction, but I think in these tollers between um, uh, between our, uh, among our community, sorry, are the ones that are even uh, more key um, on the matter. They are the ones that are contacted to change, um, let's say the the. The boilers to install the, the the solar system, the solar energy system, etc. So um, I mean, we are just now uh, on the verge of launching a a lot of communication campaign on the the installers' um, skills needs. Uh, because again, I'm sorry to get back to to that topic, but we are really pushing for people to have the the right skills 
um, in order to deal with the innovation that is created, um, because it's one thing to, to be very innovative and to find amazing solutions, but if people are not able to implement them uh, in other uh, areas, we we are going to to, to have a, a structural issue there. For your reaction, um, there is a question: uh, uh, How would building companies react if the use of secondary raw materials was made mandatory at European level? as is expected uh, progressively. Um, who would like to answer that question uh, first? Uh, is that something for Johannes or Gonzalo, maybe? I can say something on this. Yeah, um, this is a good point. And um, in that sense, we can consider two different uh, areas. One of them is the financial um, in incentives and economic instruments that could promote this uh, change to use the secondary materials. And this should be done at the, you know, at the European, national, local level, because we have to be conscious that the circular market uh, should be built in the local level, which is uh, the most important uh, area um, and the more impact uh, that we have in, in the construction sector. And the other point is to promote that on the policy approach and create this framework to promote this use of secondary materials. And why I say that? Because uh, why should I invest more money in introducing secondary materials in new buildings or renovations if I were a builder, if this is not mandatory at the Europe, at the law. And this is the point that we have to pave this way to promote the use of, rec of recovery of secondary materials and send a clear message to the industry that investment, the investment on secondary materials will have some kind of benefits in the long term because we pay the way to use of these materials in the in the in the in the legislation in a mandatory way and this is something that we have to deal with the two balance how to promote that and the policy approach with minimal requirements with setting targets to introduce secondary materials in new builds and renovations and promoting these financial incentives for the ones who wants to take this lead uh, at the beginning yeah thanks Hello. Let's uh, let's make the link to two of our startups to ask them a question. Uh, you 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 speak about uh, the importance of also introducing new materials. Um, we have the Rice House. Uh, we have Waterweg. They introduce basically new materials from waste material. To what kind of problems you actually run into as a startup? Do you need certification? Do you need to prove that you're end of waste? Um, uh, let's make a quick round. Uh, this year, quick reaction for you everything to do with getting materials from waste on the market. What did you experience? Please. Um, I think for us, um, one big challenge is indeed the law and certifications. So uh, yeah, it's been made really hard to work with waste streams and sometimes processes to use the waste stream or to test with it uh, and to get um, licenses for that is yeah is a really long process so especially when we now work in really small pilots we don't have the time to uh, ask for all the licenses uh, that will take like half a year so that's something that we notice a lot um and then also we're kind of in a yeah we call it in dutch the chicken egg story together with our markets and uh, our producers uh, because the markets normally says like we want the proof that it has already been produced on a big scale and that it uh, complies with all the wishes and needs that we have and that it has all the certifications. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the producers and they tell us, let's just, uh, yeah, show us how big the market is and let's show us uh, five year contracts of people that want to buy your product and then we will produce it. So yeah, we're in the middle of this and we're trying yeah, to get both parties uh on boards but that's yeah uh, really like a chicken egg story i would say i can really understand that how is that for you emmanuel uh, with the rice house which is something like a demonstration project but how see this going forward if you want to expand all the materials and applications i think something i i i, I think 
that probably something that we have to face right now and we are facing are uh, also not only the low regulation or the certification, but the trust of the customers. For example, we are using natural materials. This sometimes means that not all of us, all of, of the customers, uh, especially in the um, traditional market, knows how to use these materials or they don't trust of these materials. So more than the problem of the law and the certification so we need to face <clears throat> the uh, like we we need to, to create a sort of uh, trust chain by using natural production mainly natural products and this is something that we, we we are trying to do right now with a very strong communication with uh, uh, our project. We are an, we I saw before I said before that we are also architects. So when we start from from us, so we are using our materials to to show that it's possible to use it. So I think that the trust of the customers are something to face at the same level of the law and the regulation and certifications to expand the, you know, the network and the selling products and the selling uh, chain. It's from the words of Laura as well, uh, that um, you need to build trust uh, and awareness uh, on, the, on the market side. So going a little bit towards the end, I have one uh, nice content question for Johannes for a two minute answer. And then I will go back to our three uh, startups to ask them, what do they need at this moment in time to make a success of their startup? How can we help them most? Because we have one more than 100, uh, let's say an audience 100 who might be able to help them. So first, uh, a tricky question for Johannes. Uh, what about measuring circularity in buildings? How can we reduce the many processes associated to construction to one circularity performance indicator? It's a tough one, Johannes, over to you for a two minute answer. Uh, that's uh, I actually asked this question to, to be answered by by also others that have knowledge in that. I mean, we try, we try, and, and uh, we see that there are many different indicators, and that there is no real alignment on that. We see that DGNP and uh, Madasta, EPEA, Circularity Building Passports, all these like evolve. Uh, several of them are closed to a paid audience, which is I think obvious. Um, uh, to, to a certain extent, but but also limits uh, the usability of the circularity assessment for buildings. So uh, I would I would really also believe that the that we can we can reduce these if we pull them all together and find a methodology that we all agree on. Let's say the the circularity community, then we can do uh, some indicator for that and. Johannes, I think you, you referred that you were, was curious, you were curious to hear the advice also from others. So Sabine, you get a one minute reaction to this question as well, because I think we referred to, Madasta was referred to as well. And then we go to the, 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 the three startups again. Sabine, over to you. Yes, I fully agree with you, Johannes, that we need a sort of standard in the, in the, in the market. But I think uh, um, what Madasta did is we uh, um, evolved on the uh, standard already developed by um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation early in, in 2015. I think that is that's a, it's a very clear standard which which says uh, um, what is the amount of uh, recycled material, how is uh, um, the um, building uh, being used, or a material or a product being used longer than in 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 this in average on the market, and then how is the recyclability or the reusability at the end of life. And I think uh, those three uh, stages are very, very important when you talk uh, circularity. Uh, then certainly it's important uh, how do you assess how um, the uh, deconstructability of a building. Uh, there's great work being done at the moment uh, for the University of Wuppertal. And um, I do see there uh, are sort of standards evolving in this direction. But, but I think uh, it is good to have uh, sort of this uh, common ground. Um, and I think the Ellen MacArthur Foundation methodology already established a quite um, good uh, starting point for that. Thanks, Sabine. Something we probably should explore deeper also in our leadership group when it continues uh, with the new topics. Uh, um, a quick round uh, along our startups, uh, starting with Dominique. In one sentence, what would help you most at this moment in time? Dominique. 
Um, yeah, I would say taking the momentum on changing regulation, raising awareness, and, and just uh, really implementing also all the all the things we just mentioned uh, from the presenters before, but also from the startups. I think that's what it needs. Over to Emmanuel uh, from uh, 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 from Rice House. Choose the question. What would you need most to bring the concept of Rice House further? What would help you most? Is it uh, input material? Is it the market? Uh, is it access to finance? I think that has to be finance awareness of consumption. So probably the awareness of the customers. So I really we need we need that all of us all of the customers knows that it's possible to use natural materials as exactly as the traditional one. Great. Last but not least, Wies van Lieshout van Waterweg, what would you need most? Totally agree with Dominique. And uh, next to that, we are uh, working on some collaborations uh, with Germany and Belgium. And we would really love to uh, yeah, get to know some funding opportunities for that. So if anyone knows any European funding opportunities for collaborations, then uh, yeah, please uh, ring my bell or email me at wies at waterweg.co. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, now we have come to the end of this uh, leadership group session. We heard the plans of the commission. We launched our new brochure. Yeah, we had three deep dives, three power pitches from entrepreneurs and a great power panel from uh, from experts. Uh, so I'm super proud of, uh, of all the, the, the contributions here and super proud of the work of the leadership group. This topic is important. This topic will stay. We'll continue our work with the leadership groups on builders and infrastructure. If you're interested and you want to contribute, do contact us, do contact the Secretariat of ASAPS. And thank you for your attention uh, and keep the conversation going. Thank you so much. Uh